First thing I want to cover, certainly, should be the first on anyone's list, and that is the sound itself. Just what sound should we be expecting from any particular instrument, whether it be trumpet, whether it be trombone, tuba, or the euphonium? Now, the sound to be produced utilizes four elements. These elements being embouchure, breath, equipment, and concept. Without any of these four elements, we are in trouble. Without being able to teach these four elements and understand them as a performer, we are lacking in the basic tone production that is so necessary. That we must have the right embouchure. We must have the right breath and correct breath support. We must have the right equipment and truly a concept. Let me get into the embouchure first. I believe maybe a little differently and I will approach you now from the beginning stages because this is where the embouchure is established. But right now, are you not looking at me with a fine embouchure? Is not your chin pointed? Is not the corners of your lip quite set? You're not smiling, you're not puckering. It's when we work with the youngster and we mention, don't do this, don't do that, that we begin to have trouble. If we tell a youngster, don't smile now, don't smile. Then they bring the corners in too far. And we end up with this type of sound, the sound you're so used to hearing. Now, you don't have students that sound like that, do you? This is the opposite of smiling, of directing everything right to the middle, of getting the buzz coming right here in the middle of the embouchure. Way too tight here in the center. And this can be started simply by saying, now don't smile. So they bring it in too tight. Plus the fact, of course, the youngsters are really desirous of getting this first sound, and they are tight. Their muscles are too weak, so they pinch it together. But now if we tell a student not to pucker, so they bring the corners back. And then we have this sound. The real hard sound. The hard, bright, harsh sound, which certainly is not the approach and the sound that we expect from a euphonium. We want just the basic fundamentals which are there. I will tell a youngster usually one thing, and that is your lips are together, right? Now blow the air down just at a 45 degree angle. All of you try that. Just blow the air down at a 45 degree angle. Now you notice you don't smile, you don't pucker, the chin goes a little flat, and for the center range of your instrument, in this middle range, the air does travel downward to some degree. It will not go straight into the horn. If you do blow it straight into the horn, you usually have to smile, and you will then get this bright sound again. I'm directing the air straight to the middle part of the mouthpiece. I wish for my air to have a slight downward angle at this beginning stage. Going downward in the mouthpiece for the middle range. But if we can keep it as simple in our instructions to the youngsters, simple in our approach as performers, the more natural we can perform, the better our sounds are going to be, the more relaxed we will be. I think it's so important that we do keep things quite natural and quite relaxed. Firm, yes, and the firmness coming through practice, through going through the right exercises, of getting the muscles strong so that it can be firm yet still relaxed. But basically, this is the embouchure that I teach, having the fundamentals correct simply by not emphasizing what the students will be doing wrong. With your beginning classes, you will have those who will have problems, who all of a sudden the chin will bunch up, or who will smile, or who will pucker. It's these individuals that we have to work with and single out their problems. They will be in the minority. Keep things simple in our instructions, and then if you see a problem, we go over and we work with this one individual or this other individual. But if you just simply blanket out to a group of not to do this, that you do something else, then we get in problems with the youngster of wanting to overdo it. 
and then we have too tight of embouchures or too hard of embouchures. Breath. Item number two. Now we have two problems with breath. Of getting the air in, then getting the air back out. Let's go through something which I think is valuable in working with youngsters. And I say youngsters, I use the same technique with my own students. I have yet to have a student walk into my studio that breathes really correctly, that is fulfilling the requirements of breath, of using breath to the extent that it should be. I have to go through this routine with him, of filling up correctly. And doing something will be worth a thousand words. We can get up in front of our class and explain how we want the air to go downward, how we want the lungs to fill from the bottom up and expand here and expand there and so forth. But if we can just come across one little action which will teach it to them without saying anything, then we have accomplished much more of getting them to feel a right way to do it. Instead of trying to explain it to them, get them in some position or action which will cause them to feel the right way to do it. Now, here's what I have my students do. I'd like for all of you to slide up on the edge of your chairs. Good. Now, lean over in your chairs. Lean over as far as you can, putting your hands underneath the outside of your legs. Just pull yourself down. All right, all of you take a breath. All right, you see where that air is going? Try to breathe in correctly. Try to make that air go to the top part of your chest. It's impossible, isn't it? Okay, so now I'm going to stay down there for a minute. Stay down. You're not through yet, people. All right, take a breath. All right, come up two inches. Take another breath. Come up two more inches. Take another breath. And keep it going into the same direction. Keep coming up, breathing. All right, now you're sitting upright. Right now, you have taught the students where that air goes. In that length of time, you have taught them where the air will end up and be sucked in to the bottom part of the lungs from this position. And you will have to keep your eye open as the class does this for that one or two individuals that will lose it as they come up. Now, this is really only half of it. Did you not just expand the bottom part of the lungs here? Just this lower part? Are not our lungs also up at the upper part of the chest? So we have to go a step further. Now, you've been breathing correctly, but only halfway. Let's breathe the rest of the way and fill the lung capacity right up here to the top part of the chest, that everything will expand. And then the person has a full capacity of air. But of course, the usual things are necessary, that the shoulders don't move, that it's all related to the actual lung area. But in getting it across to the younger students or of any uh, individual as a performer who feels that they aren't pulling this air in correctly, put yourself over and in this position of leaning forward with your head between your legs and breathing in. That's item number one, getting this air in. How do we get it back out again? I utilize two ways to get this air, to get across to the student how to project the air the intensity that it must have. Now, as far as terminology goes, I use the terminology that the air must go fast. You must have the feeling that that air is traveling. All right, now if something is traveling fast, what else does it do? A bullet is traveling fast. What else does that bullet do? Spins. If you shoot a, a bow and arrow, say, that arrow is going fast, what else is that arrow doing? Spinning. If you think of motion, of speed, you invariably will relate it also to spinning. So if we can think of those two things, that the air moves fast, that the air spins through that horn of getting this air doing something, traveling somewhere, having a definite purpose, and a purpose means motion, now, to get this across to a youngster, what can we do? I utilize two ways. Number one is having the students holler hey. And I mean really hollering hey. I want all of you to try that, okay? 
Yeah, you, right away, one of the first things you do is set up, isn't it? Get you to do something. Sit up all the time. All right, here we go. Hollering, hey. Right with me now. Ready? Now. Hey! hey! Did you feel what happened down here? Did you feel what happened? Do it again and notice how the throat feels. Ready? Now. Hey! It's open, isn't it? You don't go, hey! No. Hey! It's open. All right. But it's a quick jerk. That doesn't fulfill what we want. Now, the next thing I have the students do is hiss. Try that. Take a breath and, and hiss at me. <sighs> do you feel it? Do you feel what's happening? Okay, okay. Then what else is happening that's wrong with hissing? Many teachers use just this, the hissing. But there is something wrong with just hissing. Your throat is all closed up, is it not? So this is why I go back and say to the students, this is why we hollered, hey. If you can have the same feeling when you are blowing on your instrument of projecting that sound, the same feeling as when you were hissing with the feeling of the hay, the opening of the throat, this, in essence, is really how we should feel when we are performing that instrument, of getting the intensity and drive of the hiss, the openness of hollering hay. This is getting that air out. But we do have another problem. If you can imagine one steady, long line of sound. Now, if we took a breath and just held it without any intensity, the first part of our sound would be all right. But then halfway through that sound, what would begin to happen to the tonal quality and the pitch of that sound? It would begin to drop without any intensity. And at the tail end of our phrase is where we need to really project that air. Not at the beginning, but most of us project at the beginning. I want all of you now to take a breath and just hold it. What is that air trying to do? Let it out. That's what it's trying to do. It's trying to get out of there. When we take a breath and play on our instruments, if we start pushing this air, which wants to get out of there anyway, and then we drive the air, what happens to the tail end of our phrases? We have nothing left. We have engaged our air. At the beginning of our phrases, people, we don't have to push that strong. We don't have to have this strong, intensified feeling because this air is wanting to get out of there anyway. It has to be supported, yes, but nothing like as the tone and this line of sound progresses. As, if you can imagine once again, this line dropping off in a curve downwards, symbolizing the flatness and the intensity, losing ground because of losing intensity at the end of the phrase. What we have to do is go through, and as the phrase gets longer, is push harder, and push harder at the tail end of that phrase. This is where we really need to support. This is where we need to drive that sound, so that in reality, even though we want a note to stay steady, straight, and firm, our breath line, even though we will not crescendo, should actually look much like a crescendo. We keep the air well supported so that it is constantly intensified the longer the phrase. Now, too many of us work in reverse. We push at the beginning, and then we have nothing left over at the end. So. Phrase endings suffer. And you band directors, you band directors, in working with a phrase in your band, where do you have your problems? Do you have problems with the beginning of a phrase or the end of a phrase? At the end of a phrase. Because of the lack of being able to control this air, intensified for the entire length of that whole phrase. So not only do we have to worry about getting the air in, getting the air back out, but gauging that air so that all of the air doesn't go out at the beginning, but that we do have one straight, pure, smooth phrase, gauging the air. The third thing, equipment. And in equipment, that we are intelligent. Uh, with the beginner, that we don't start on too large of a mouthpiece. Or as a performer, that we don't perform on too small of a mouthpiece that the equipment that we have is the right equipment for us. 
At the beginning level, a medium mouthpiece. Not overly deep, not overly large. If it's too large, their muscles cannot control this large mouthpiece, and they're fighting the mouthpiece. If it's too small and too shallow, then it offers too much resistance. The same with starting at a beginner on the smaller bore type instrument. There's so much resistance that it is too difficult. It doesn't give enough freedom for the beginner. But as we develop, as we grow on our instruments, we should think in terms of developing toward larger mouthpieces, deeper mouthpieces, larger board instruments for the sound which today is being more accepted as the brass sound, which is a larger sound, a deeper type sound, a fuller sound, not the brightness in sound. The larger the mouthpiece, the deeper the cup, the larger the sound, the darker the sound. Now, people, this can be carried to an extreme, can it not? That a person goes into just too large of a mouthpiece. I have tried to use a larger mouthpiece. My sound does suffer. It gets too open. My accuracy suffers. So that at the present time, this mouthpiece is the mouthpiece which works. Others use larger mouthpieces. Those that are playing all the time and really able to control it are able to use a larger mouthpiece. But they wish to have this larger sound, and they want this larger concept of sound. So as we develop on our instruments, we certainly must think in terms of going toward larger mouthpieces to give us the full and the depth of sound that we need. Intelligence will tell us between the performer or the student and the teacher of when a person is ready to move on to a larger mouthpiece. As we develop with our sound, as we develop with our control, we also must think in terms of going to a larger mouthpiece and larger board instruments to give us the concept of sound that uh, is needed for today's bands and is needed for today's brass concept of sound. Now, the fourth thing, which I just mentioned, concept. Now, people, here is an important element. I will not say that it is more important than embouchure or that it is more important than breath or more important than equipment. But it is equally as important. I hate to put any one of these elements over each other and say this is the most important one because if any one is lacking, then our sound is also lacking. But concept, you must have right up in your ears what this instrument is supposed to sound like. One of the main reasons that you are here today, that you came to this clinic, was it really to hear me talk? Have you not heard persons talk time and time and time again? You band directors will bear me out here. But more than anything, you came here to see what I sounded like. You wanted to hear this particular instrument performed. Good, bad, or indifferent. It's immaterial. But you wanted to hear the horn. Get a concept of its sound. And this is the way it should be. And with youngsters, they should be made well aware of what their particular instruments sound like. Now, people, where can you get this concept? Of course, records. Think of the television set. I mention that simply because it is the most adaptable device that we have and the most expedient device that we have available to us. Have you noticed lately in the commercials the beautiful oboe work, the French horn, the theme music? I guarantee you'll never hear the euphonium coming underneath some music off your television set. And this is why I appreciate your attendance here today. I hope that you will get some idea of what a euphonium should sound like, what the correct sound is, just how bright is it, how dark is it, the timbre of it, just in general the concept. If I was to try to take this horn and paint a mental picture or think of something tangible that I could look at, that I could touch relative to the sound of this horn, I would think of a big piece of blue velvet. I would look at it. That's the color of my sound. I could walk over and I could feel it, and it would be very, very smooth to the touch, very pleasing. This is the sound of the euphonium. But you must have a concept. And as often as you are able to listen to various performers on your particular instrument, your concept will develop. And until the point where you will have in your ear 
a sound that you can strive for. And again, your sound is going to be different than mine because your concept will be slightly different than mine. Plus physical differences in our own structure, they're going to be different. None of us will have the exact same concept. But we must develop a concept nonetheless. So we listen and we listen. The only way that we can get a concept is by using our ears and developing this concept. So to get our sound, the sound which is acceptable, the correct sound, we have embouchure, breath, equipment, and concept. These four elements, and in our teaching we cover these four elements. In our practicing we cover these four elements. And we ask ourselves and evaluate our own plane as where we stand relative to these four elements. The next thing I would like to get into is the use of the tongue. Tongue placement. Now, first of all, I want all of you to say ta. Just say ta for me. Go ahead. What happened to your jaw? It dropped, did it not? And yet this is one of the things that we try to cover in our brass plane is to perform and not have the jaw bouncing, that we do have a steady jaw. When we start a beginner off, we usually have them say ta, because it certainly opens the throat. It has the throat correct. Ta, ta, ta. But I don't think that most brass players really tongue that way, that far back in the roof of the mouth. You will also notice to say ta, does not the tongue have to curl up a little bit to reach the roof of the mouth. Not really a comfortable position. Ta, ta, the tongue should fold out toward the teeth. And I believe that the tongue, in articulation of starting this note, that the tongue strikes the back part of the top teeth right where they go into the gum line. Now just reach up there and feel that position. Just reach up there and feel where that tongue goes into the teeth. Now you notice I didn't ask you to say anything because I haven't come across a word, a vocabulary word, that does put the tongue in that position. But it's just up behind the teeth and tha, tha, it comes down and back off of this position. Now let me use a terminology here with you. So many of us in our teaching say to the students, students, I want you to tongue at this given point. I tell my students the tongue, the back of the top teeth where it goes into the gum line. But in reality, as far as terminology goes, this is incorrect. I like to think of the rebound effect. We don't tongue there, we tongue away from there. That we don't tongue the teeth, we tongue away from the teeth. Some of you people can remember our grandmothers when they had to the iron, they had the old wood stove had about four irons sat out on the wood stove. They would be using one of them, and then when that iron got cooled off, they'd reach over and they'd grab another one. Now, how did they test that iron to make sure that it was hot enough? They'd lick their finger, and they'd go at that iron with this wet finger. But when that finger was traveling to that iron, just before it got there, what happened? That hand started backing off. Never really made it to that hot iron. It was a rebound. She was touching away from the iron. It made it there, but it was a rebound type reaction. This is the way that we have to tongue, of tonguing away from the teeth. A feeling of coming off of the teeth. The person who tongues at the teeth will have a harder articulation and use more tongue. And it's less tongue that will help us have a much lighter tongue. But I hope you understand as far as tongue placement goes, that we tongue away from the teeth at the point where the teeth go into the gum line. Now let me mention something which I faithfully use with my own students. That is the use of soft attacks. One of my biggest bugs is the person who hammers his attack. Now there is nothing in music that starts off with this smack, unless it's for strictly effect purposes. Yet we'll have people, youngsters, oldsters, everybody, that'll pick up their horn and they'll go. Do 
that you not have students right now, band vectors, that this is how their attack starts, with this wham on it. Now, we must get away from that. The actual attack is the ugliest part of our sounds. And the less tongue that we can use, the more pure sound we actually have. And I believe an effective way to get away from using so much tongue is to work on soft attacks. Right at the point where sound just doesn't quite make it, that you actually lose the sound. Right at this level. Now, all this is doing is disciplining that tongue to come off the teeth very easily. It's more of a psychological approach than anything else, of disciplining the tongue. And is not our entire training process disciplining us to react a certain way. This is why we use scales, to discipline the fingers, to move rhythmically precise, and to respond a certain pattern. In all of our practicing, of getting ourselves to react to certain circumstances. Now here we are with this soft attack, disciplining the tongue to move ever so gently off the teeth. And as you work on this, the tongue will get lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter to the point that you can say to yourself, if I can start a sound with this less tongue, is there any reason at all I should ever tongue any harder? Because where does volume of sound come from? Does it come from the tongue? No, it comes from the air, the intensity that we put behind it. Now, you will use a stronger tongue as you get louder, but not to the point, then, of an explosion. So that in working on soft attacks, we are disciplining the tongue to move easily off of the teeth and telling us, that I don't have to use this heavy tongue to start a note. Why should I use it then? Now, can you see a couple other elements here that are being developed by using soft attacks? Control. Can you see how this would just really help your control? That if you can pick up your horn and the note responds, mm -hmm. that the next time the band vector comes in on the second movement of something, right there it is. Because the students have developed this control. That they don't come in with a da, because they had to use this heaviness to get it started. Then they can go soft, because the hardest part is getting that sound going. But this is working on control. If you work on soft attacks, you're working on control. Here's the element maybe that you hadn't thought about. If a student comes in to me and he has a relatively sluggish tongue, I say, let's work on soft attacks. You want to learn how to tongue fast? The first thing to do is work on soft attacks. They don't see the relationship right away. But what is a sluggish tongue, a slow tongue? It's the tongue that not only is hitting too hard, right, but also the tongue that is moving too far. The rebound is of a greater distance. When you work on soft attacks, how far does that tongue actually move? It moves just a small amount, doesn't it? It just barely moves off of the teeth, so that the distance then to get back to the teeth is smaller. And therefore, we have a faster tongue, because we are disciplining the tongue to move a smaller distance, a lesser distance, off the teeth, back, and then back to the teeth again. So soft attacks can help us out greatly. And I, I'm almost assured that this is one element that you brass people haven't spent much time at, that you haven't worked much on soft attacks. But it will help. It'll help your control. It'll help the rapidness of your tongue. It's an element that should be covered in our fundamental warming up and preparatory exercises before we actually get into the literature of our practicing period. So work on some soft attacks. It's a necessity for us as brass players. The next thing that I would like to cover is flexibility.
one thing that a brass player definitely needs is flexibility. How many baritone players are here today? Good, good. Now, how many of you people have played this little solo and it has come out like this? Is this not one of the hardest things to perform? You're all out of breath and your lip is stiff, so to get this response from that F down to the B flat is one of the hardest things to do. But the main problem is flexibility of being able to go from one open slur to another one easily. So in my teaching, I use a set of lip slurs which was given to me by my teacher, which more than likely was given to him by his teacher. And if any portion of this various set of lip slurs will help you, then go ahead and use them. Any brass player can make up their own. The pattern is unimportant. But the fact that we must work on lip slurs is important. For flexibility, going back to gauging error, as you do a set pattern, you have to drive stronger at the end of a phrase, at the end of the lip slur, more so than at the beginning. Now let me run through the set that I use. This is the pattern that I use and the pattern that I teach to my students. Starting out in the middle range, at the very middle part of your register, and working to the extreme ranges of the horn in lip slurs. So on down to two and three, one and three, one, two and three. And then the second set, after the student begins to get quite flexible on this particular lip slur, then I'll go into the next one. After this one begins to get quite smooth for the student. I stick in an octave. Now all the time that I work with slipsters with the students, one thing I keep in constant demand of the student. The breath line itself is just one steady straight stream of air with this crescendo I mentioned about gauging the air, that you have to push, push, push. All right, then I go into an octave lip slur. <laughs> All the way down again to one, two, and three. Then after this one is smooth, once again, going all the way down to one, two, and three, and then usually the final stage of the lip slur beam. And then after you've completely covered those, then you can pick up your horn and... The B-flat will be responsive for you. Simply because your lip will feel easy. Your lip will feel relaxed. It won't be tight. And you will have a real command. So this is another element of all brass playing. Whether you're a trumpet player, whether you're a trombone player, that you establish a set of lip slurs that you cover. Just like you cover your major scales, just like you cover your minor scales, just like you cover your thirds. It's another element of development 
that we must use. I'd like to toss in something here. Did you notice that my head did not move too much in doing the lip slurs? That I really wasn't doing much of a pivot? Do you know what I mean by pivot? That as we go up for the upper register, we either bring the head forward and up, or some persons do it the other way around. But usually most persons have to raise the head and push the jaw forward by moving the head or bringing the horn down as they go up, similar to this. You see how the horn is moving and the head is moving? Now this is a pivot system. As you go up, more pressure is applied to the lower jaw by bringing the lower jaw closer to the mouthpiece by raising the head or bringing the horn down. Also, what happens to the breath line as you raise the head forward? The breath line climbs up in the mouthpiece so that you are directing that air more to the center and the upper part of the mouthpiece the higher you go. Now, I use a system of jaw motion. The higher I go, my lower jaw comes forward as well as up, but it comes forward. I'll use this and see if you can't see my jaw moving forward. You see my jaw moving there? The higher I go, I push my lower jaw forward and up. Now let's compare the two. As I raise my head up, I place more pressure against the mouthpiece, my lower jaw. As I push my lower jaw forward, keeping my head straight and steady, am I not also applying more pressure with the lower jaw against the mouthpiece? Now, I use the word pressure, not extensive pressure. I'm not talking about the pressure to the upper lip of jamming it in. I'm not talking about this. But uh, the higher we go of beginning to equalize the pressure between the upper jaw and the lower jaw. So in essence, both are doing the same thing, whether you move the head or push the jaw forward. Both of them are putting more pressure to the lower jaw. Also, and try this, with your jaw in a normal position, blowing that air directed downward, as we talked about in forming the embouchure, what happens to your breath line? Does not the breath rise? So once again, whether it is a pivot system or just strictly the jaw motion, we are basically doing the same thing. I prefer the use of the jaw. If a person is having trouble in the upper register, he knows that his embouchure is right. He knows that he is using the breath correctly. Everything is working well for him. Try the pivot or the jaw and see how this works out with your own development. Helping you get into the upper register and then helping you also get into the lower register by working in reverse of the jaw coming back and down for this low register. And when you get into the low register, here usually the jaw will not be enough and you do have to go over to a pivot point so that the lower register does respond for you. But most brass players definitely have to use either a pivot system or utilizing the jaw. Now let me bring something else up. You've heard me play a few sounds here today and basically with the sounds you have heard a vibrato. And I want to mention this because the vibrato I use is a little different than what most brass players utilize. Most brass players are using the jaw vibrato, basically for euphonium, for trombone, for tuba. The jaw vibrato is the most widely accepted and used. However, the vibrato that I use is a breath vibrato. The same vibrato that a flutist uses, the same vibrato that an oboist uses the same vibrato that if any of you do any singing that you already have. It's this natural vibrato stemming from the breath line. Now I teach my students the jaw because it's the most widely used and accepted. After they have learned the jaw vibrato, then if they wish and are inquisitive enough, we go into the breath vibrato. Whichever one you use, do it slowly. Don't rush. Do it slowly. Very, very slowly. Let me go through the jaw vibrato with you. Show you the extreme that I think must be done as far as getting the jaw moving. We'll start out and we'll have the jaw move this far. 
of really letting that jaw come down and open up, getting a very ugly sound when it is open, but disciplining us to get it open, to get the jaw moving and not scared to move the jaw. After a week of working on this type of work, then we might move up. A little quicker, and you notice a little narrower. Not quite as wide as before. And as we develop this vibrato, the faster it becomes is where we narrow it down. The next step would be... <laughs> Clicking the metronome up a little quicker. After a couple months or so, this would be in working toward the jaw vibrato. The breath vibrato, very similar, except we start out slowly by accenting with the breath line at regular pulsations of using the breath. quicker. And right about that speed, all of a sudden, you'll notice that an involuntary throat muscle will be reacting and doing most of the work for you. It started out down here at the stomach line, but the faster it goes, it comes up and is all of a sudden beginning to be controlled through an involuntary throat muscle. The next step then, you would really begin to feel it in the throat. Very little motion then, the faster you go, down in the stomach line. hardly feel it at all here in the throat. Don't get the feeling that you should really feel something working for you here in the throat. You won't. And then finally, <laughs> this being the breath vibrato. In either extent, whether it's the jaw or the breath, you start slowly and you work up and you speed up gradually, that it does move slow enough that it will be done correctly. Now, when do you start the vibrato? Not until a person can pick up his horn and play one straight, steady sound. I have students right now who play well, but I wouldn't dare give them a vibrato because their sound hasn't leveled out yet. Their muscles just aren't strong enough it's not a real, steady, pure, straight sound. But once you can get this steady, open, clear sound, then work with the vibrato. To finish up, let me get into the practice period itself. Now, practicing, we know, it's accepted. 
No clinician has to stand up here and say, I practice four hours a day. That means you should practice four hours a day. We all understand that practicing is just a necessity. Anything that I say, anything that any clinician says, is strictly speaking of the physical characteristics of getting things basically correct. You have to take it from there. You have to go out and you have to set in the practice room. You are the one that has to develop it further. You are the one that then has to become a musician with the fundamentals of the right approach and of working on the instrument. We say that in school work we have the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. In practicing our horns, people, we have the three M's. We have a metronome. We have a mirror and the music. We need a metronome because what is one thing that all of us have trouble with? Because we're human. Because we are not a machine, but rhythm. We have trouble with rhythm, so we need a metronome. It's a necessity that we get a metronome and that we faithfully use a metronome. We need a mirror. Why do we need a mirror? Because we cannot really feel what happens with the embouchure. Too many times as a student progresses, especially into the upper register, they begin to smile just for the sake of getting the notes. You need something visual that you can use to check your embouchure, of looking in that mirror, of checking the embouchure, checking how much pressure you are using, and to check the placement of it. And then, of course, music. That you have the books, which are the method books for your particular instrument. That every brass player has an Arvin's book. Getting those scales, getting those arpeggios, developing these fundamentals, which are so necessary for developing a response. Your repertoire is graded for your performance. As you develop, the solos also develop. Because the constant development of your ability, your qualities as a musician, is dependent upon the literature that you use. So in your practicing, three ends, metronome, mirror, and the music. Basically, this is what I wanted to cover with you today, what I think are just basic fundamentals. There are many things I know which I have completely forgotten, completely left out. But basically, these fundamentals will help you as much as any set of fundamentals. Some of them I expect you to certainly try. Some of them I know that you won't try. But nonetheless, evaluate what you've heard. Constant evaluation is the mark of a master teacher, the teacher that is able to constantly improve by taking what he has done, what he has said, the techniques he uses, evaluate them, throw some away, keep some. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.